to the Fearless Curious Soul. Goldilocks Productions presents The Deep Reading. <laughs> Connecting you to your soul show. This is Suzanne Wyman, The Deep Psychic. Welcome. Thank you for joining me today. So while I do this uh, broadcast, I want you to think about the commentary. And if you relate to it, I want you to feel included and know if this conversation resonates to what is currently happening in your life, that this is for you too. So, you're part of something greater than yourself. The universe is connecting to you and supporting you. So, I'm doing a lot of call-ins today, and so I'm just going to do one call-in after the next, and maybe make a follow-up commentary afterwards. Please do call in. The call in number is area code 206 806 9965. You're speaking with the deep psychic. You're getting a deep reading. My home phone number is 714 400 7384. You can read my webpage at com. And of course, it has that www in front of it. Okay, I'm hoping that my first caller is waiting on the line and is ready to go. No. Okay, well, let's see who calls in, and let's have a conversation about what's going on today. So one of the things that I do is I do something I call the tea party, and what I do is I do a reading on people's tea leaves. Persian tea works the very best. Persian tea um, is long and it makes it possible for you to get a casting in the bottom of a cup. Really important to use a pure white inside cup. And it tells you a story, a very direct story. I suppose that because I do dream interpretation, it sort of makes more sense to me than it does other people. But one in eight people have a... um, ability to naturally do tea leaf readings. So we'll talk further about that today. And I'm ready for my first caller, so let's just go ahead and go to the callers right away today. Hello? Hello. Hello, hi. Hi, hi who's this? Uh, this is Courtney. Hi, Courtney, how are you? I'm okay. How are you? Really good. Do you have a question for me today? I was uh, calling on a situation that's happening in my life right now, and I was just wondering, I wanted to uh, stretch my spirituality and reach my human potential. And um, with my business, my I have a small business, and I'm, I've been given an opportunity to serve my community by providing people with ordering with an ordering station. Um, at my uh, vape shop for medical marijuana. And I would like to create harmony and peace between the city and uh, uh, our store and our uh, our service here that we've been providing to okay. hopefully come with a uh, conclusion and hopefully be able to provide this for the community. Oh, what a great question. Okay, so... I think I think the first thing that we really need to I need to ask you very directly, Courtney, is is that are you okay serving the community and um, giving people an opportunity to get easy access to medical marijuana? Are you okay with that personally? Yes, I am. As long as it's uh, uh, over the age of twenty one, and excuse me, sorry. Uh huh. That's okay. Um, as as long as uh, it is uh, provided. Uh, you know, with regulations and uh, legally, yes, I think it's uh, a definitely a great service. We've been up and running for three and a half weeks, and I've never seen so many smiles on people's faces just because they don't have to drive or go out of their way to go get this product anymore to Santa Ana or, you know, because the, the laws and regulations. So Okay. Yes, I am okay. Great, great. So, um, but you, you have some things in place. One is, is that it's regulated, and two, it's for only people that are over 21. 
and that your primary goal is to provide people with a legal product in a safe environment. That is your that is your core level uh, objective in this situation. Correct. So yes. So good for you. Really good for you. Thank you. Um, so. As I understand it, medical marijuana is for people that have mental health issues or people that have a chronic illness, and it offers relief. From some of the symptoms, it's not a cure. It's just a um, treatment process. Is that right? Correct. It's an alternative versus taking opiates or prescription pills. Okay. Really good. And it's and it is safe. So... I think that if I tune into the situation as a psychic, I think you have an advantage because you can tune in and you can see people that really don't belong there and really shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. So, right. so you kind of have you kind of have um, an instinct, an intuition, a perception of people that would um, be classified as people that were just simply doing it for recreational purposes. And so now the objective becomes, can you take and um, go to the city and ask them if you can find a way to meet the criteria for safety? This is a brand new frontier, and you must be a chosen individual in order to be part of this brand new frontier because nobody else would be as qualified. So maybe they'll come up with ideas like you have to have cameras, you have to have a safety entrance system. You have to set up limited um, parking arrangements. Somebody can't be sitting in front of the store for hours on end. They can just sit for a few minutes. They're going to come up right. with some requirements. But the primary thing for you to convey to the person who actually owns the um, four walls that you set your business up inside is, is that you're going to take and you're going to set a standard of excellence. And this standard of excellence is going to transform form the process. There are no drugs on the premises. There right. is nothing illegal going on, and you want to meet those regulations. You also, for the time being, have to say to yourself, this is not about me. This is not about money. This is about an opportunity to serve my community. Because when you put it in a situation that you're doing higher service, all of your needs are met, and it allows you to right. grow from that. Instead of saying, okay. oh, I want to make a lot of money, and I'm going to be rich, and this is mine, no. That's just going to lead to um, a lack of harmony and conflict. And <clears throat> but if you were to talk to me directly, like I'm talking to you right now, mm -hmm. I would say there's a reason why you are drawn to this setup. It is incredibly successful. It is really powerful. And I want you to put up, some sort of post, a philosophy, a core message, an affirmation, I don't care what. But inside of that message, you're going to say, this is for the assistance of many. Okay? For the people. <laughs> for the people. Yeah. Okay? And okay. thank you for calling in. This is a big subject today. A lot of people need education and awareness. And uh, you might spend some time writing about this, how to educate okay. people and assist them to understand this better. But by the time we reach this point, this day, next year, you'll look back on this and think, what was I worried about? So get out there, okay. enjoy your life, and take this responsibility very seriously because you are a chosen individual. Okay? Thank you for Thank calling. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> okay. You are speaking with Suzanne Wyman, the deep psychic. And I really like that phone call. There's a lot of education, a lot of awareness about what needs to happen in order to take and make marijuana accessible to people who actually need it for, you know, a physical condition or an emotional disorder or actually um, a challenge with mental health. So... Because it's brand new, making it legal and accessible, Courtney has an opportunity to serve a community of people that are doing it for medical reasons and not for recreational reasons, which I believe is people's greatest fear, that there would be people that you know, wanted to get high and be hanging out in the area, and that's not the community that she's serving. She's serving the people that actually need a safe situation in order to access for their own medical needs. 
So interesting question. <sighs> interesting uh, situation, how we introduce it into our community. Okay. I'm ready for my next caller, if I've got another caller waiting for me. Hi, this is Carmen. Hi, Carmen. How are you? I'm doing great, Suzanne. Um, my oh. question is in regards to relationships. Um, mm. I'm, I'm ready for that one person. And um, for some reason, I keep going after people that are unavailable. Okay. And I feel that, you know, I have a lot to offer, and I was in a very long-standing relationship for 18 years. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, that ended by my choice, I then got into another relationship after that, which was very toxic. And um, that pretty much made me scared. <laughs> um, okay. So let's talk about so, that, okay? Yeah, what do I need to do to find that one? So, first of all, um, did your mother favor your brother, and does she still favor your brother? Um, she did. Both parents uh -huh. pretty much um, favored my brother. Um, he is now deceased, um, right. but there are still things that come your up that your comments that, that are made. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she still makes him the favorite. He's passed away, and um, it's just um, it's ashes, but she still lets you know that he's the favorite, which is kind of a manipulative, devious, um, underhanded little barb of telling you you're not worthy. You want a relationship, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to decide that you're really worthy and deserving of a relationship, and you're going to have to make a conscious choice not to choose somebody like your mother or like your father, I think in the past you've chosen a person that in some way or another resembles it. Are you available for a committed, mated, monogamous relationship? Yes. Are you a catch and a half? Oh, my gosh, yes. Beautiful, Thank you. hardworking, belonging to family. You know, you have a great job, a fabulous income. I mean... You're talented. You're one of the most warm and loving people that there is. And so it is a deep sense of unworthiness based on how your parents told you, you know, in their words, their actions, their deeds, that your brother, because he was a boy, was more valuable, and that you as the girl were not as valuable. And then... Um, rather than your mother coming out with the pain of saying, you know, I'm, I, I am grief-stricken over the fact that I have lost a child, she simply, she simply takes and makes you feel bad. Um, and it's really kind of a, it's a very, very, um, if you really look at it deeply, it's such a codependent, toxic uh, agreement the two of you continue to have that if you were to change that agreement... I think you might be very surprised. I don't think it would take much. Your mom starts to go down that line of talking about your brother. You just simply tell her, you know, Mom, you know, this just doesn't work out good for us when we talk like this. I'm not going to do it with you. And then stick to your guns. Be silent with her. But I also want you to get out there. I want you to date. I want you to tell people you're looking for a relationship. And I want you to take and tell yourself, I'm truly worthy of a relationship today. That's what I want you to chant whenever you find yourself thinking, why am I not in a relationship? If we were to listen to Napoleon Hill, he would say that you have a responsibility to change your mental attitude and to put on a positive mental attitude and to take and embrace that. No matter what unfolds, it's your job to choose to think positive about that. And I really believe that you can do this and that when we reach three months from this day, you'll see that you've met somebody. And this person isn't toxic. It isn't like your mother. It isn't like your father. It's an individual who's available to you for a committed, made a monogamous relationship, and it turns out to be the relationship that lasts you your life. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Suzanne. You're welcome. Bye-bye. <clears throat> Bye-bye. So you're listening to Suzanne Wyman, The Deep Psychic, and I am welcoming all call-ins today. 
Other days the format might be a little bit different, but today I'm welcoming all call-ins and all conversations, and we're going to cover a broad range of topics in each one of these readings. I like to keep it short. I like to get down. I like to get right there to the material, and um, I'm ready for my next caller if we have another caller waiting on the line. No? Okay. Hi, so. this is Laura. Hi. Can you say your name again? Yep, Laura. Hi, Laura. Um, Hi. Tell me, your, tell me your date of birth. Um, 10.01. What year? Um, 89. Okay. So how old does that make you? That make you 31? 30. 30, yeah. 30. Okay. So what's your question for me? Please be precise. Yes. Um, I was wondering how I can um, improve the accuracy of my, like, spiritual gifts right now because I feel like there's a lot of things shifting and I don't have a good practice on how to maintain them. Okay, is there any particular um, theory or philosophy or genre in the spiritual movement that you're following? Are you following manifestation? Are you, um, what, what aspect of it are you following? More just like um, things, messages that are received. Like a psychic? Yeah. Okay. So have you done any dream work? Have you taken and taken the time to do dream journaling? Yeah, that's funny you say that. I feel like I've been getting so many crazy dreams lately. Okay, great. Dreams are my specialty. Alex Lukeman is, of course, the current great on dream interpretation. His book is called What Your Dreams Can Teach You. He's available on Amazon. If you don't want to read it, you can listen to it in an audible version. And it's been republished nine separate times. He is the great. Of, of the people who are alive today, of course, the person who, who before him was Carl Jung, and then before Carl Jung was Freud. So Freud was the first person to say that dreams had meaning. So you start recording those dreams, you have a conversation with somebody who's an expert at dream interpretation, and then it gives you the answer. But if you tell me you're having dreams, like really vivid dreams that are giving you messages, your information has shown up. Um, sitting down, looking at the dreams and interpreting them will lead you on that journey. Do you have like a snippet of a dream you remember with great clarity? Um, oh, geez. Let me think. Um, um, I, have, I can't really remember right now. I write them down. Lately, I've been writing them down. Sometimes they include people who have deceased, too. Okay. Sometimes, I personally don't do medium work. I think life is for the living, and the people that have passed on, they have their own process. But if you are getting dreams from the other side, then you could be a person who's really good at doing medium you know, messages. But call me, and let's talk further. You can also write to me, and I'll give you some things to work on. And then when you're ready to actually do the dream interpretation, you and I will go to work on that. But I really appreciate your call in today. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dreams. Dreams have got to be my absolute all-time favorite subject to talk about. I ask that people have them written down and that they try and keep them brief. And then usually, not always, but the first line tells me the theme of the dream, and then the dream just sort of unfolds in that process. So dreams... Your subconscious state is trying to give you a very simple direct message. You're the one who doesn't understand what your subconscious is telling you. You've made it more complicated. Your dream state is actually simple and direct and honest. A play on words, a play on how the sentence is put together, um, visuals, people that you know. It gives you so much information. So uh, I am of a firm belief that the foundation of our spiritual work is in dream interpretation. I believe it is one of the most important primary pieces that needs to be done in order to stabilize your spiritual work. So, Laura, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to talk about my favorite subject. And I'm ready for another caller. Do we have another caller here? Hello. How are you? Hello. Oh, my gosh. Who is this? This is Dale. Dale, how are you? I am doing great. How are you doing? 
You have an, a magnificent voice. Do you know that? Why, thank you very much. I've, I've mm-hmm. been using it for 61 years now. Wow. You sound so much younger. Do you have a question for me? I do. I have a passion for restoring old historic cemeteries. I love the artistry on the stones. And I've been working on um, a cemetery here in Texas for about 16 years now, uh, which is almost a fourth of my life. And I'm running into problems with the bureaucracy of the city. Um, You know, they want me to have insurance. We we do historic walking tours, and and they're afraid that someone's going to sue the city if they trip over something. Um, Mm -hmm. So I'm getting kind of frustrated, but I don't want to give up. Do you have any advice for me? I do. Well, first of all, I want to tell you that the primary work that you're doing is connected to you as a person in your own personal story. So the significance of your father dying early in your life and how it changed your life, your brother's life, and everybody in your family's life has been the driving force of you to protect the cemetery because that's your way of protecting the memory of your father and embracing the importance of your father in your day-to-day life. So that's the driving force behind it. That's the passion. That's the unconscious motivation of it. That's also the desire for deep respect for people that have passed on. You've gotten trapped into a political issue which has nothing to do with any reality. And that is the thing that we really need to focus in on. So um, I think, and this is, I, I really apologize in advance, I think that there are two parts to this. One, I think it is a money issue. Two, I think it is a race issue. Um, I think that if this was a cemetery of people that were known and um, were not people of color, I think that this wouldn't be an issue. I think the money, um, the organization skills, and the support would be given to you. And then the other thing is is that the city wants to have the excuse that it isn't their problem. And just, Dale, just being honest with you, why do people say that when they say that's not their problem? What are they, what are they really saying without saying it? Well, I, I, I think you're spot on about the money. Uh, uh, cemeteries, the only piece of property that you sell once, but you're expected to maintain forever. And, and I agree in some point that if the city has limited funds, that we should be buying uh, kids a hot lunch at, at school and, uh-huh. and uh, not spending money on what they perceive as something that's frivolous and really the private property of the families who have long deceased, um, which is kind of where we're at. Is, is you know they, they say, well, that's not our problem because those monuments don't belong to us. They belong to the families. And when we try to work on them, they go, well, you need to get permission from the family. I go, we're seven generations removed, you know. And the state law allows me to do this, but I get, I still get caught up in the, the circle of bureaucracy. Okay, okay. So when somebody says that's not our problem, they're saying I really feel bad about it, but I don't really feel bad about it enough to actually make any changes. So now I'm going to ask you in your thinking to ask them what are the changes that are necessary in order to turn this into not a um, political issue but an issue of taking care of our city's history because the graveyard has become the keeper of historical facts. So, exactly. So in this way, you're not asking them to take care of the monuments to the dead. You're asking them to help you find a way to use money that you raise to keep the history. And obviously, um, I'm sure you've had the place declared a historical monument. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is your journey. This is your life's passion. But... When you find yourself um, in an argument with somebody, I think you're just going to have to stop and you're going to have to backpedal. But 
I don't think, I think that this year is the changing point because your attitude about it changes and how you approach people about this and how you expect it to be resolved. Instead of thinking that it's a situation where the city should help you, you're going to think that there's help available to you. You simply have to access it. And then that's just your shift, and then it makes it easier. I think it's an incredibly worthy goal. I think it's an incredible dream to have. And I personally happen to really like cemeteries, but I'm kind of a dark person. Okay. So remember. All righty. Um, go ahead. I was going to say, thank you. That, that gives me hope. I was almost ready to quit. No, no, don't quit. Please don't quit. You're well, ready. No, there's, You're ready. There's, there's other projects. Yeah, there's other projects, but this one here is one of the most oldest and, and most in need, you know. And yeah. so that's what attracted me to the project. It's a valuable project. It's preserving history. It's not preserving dead monuments. And um, I think you just need to start asking for help, and I think it will be given to you. And um, this is a three-year goal. And this is a three-year project. There's a shift that happens this year, but this is a three-year project. And so that's what you need to do is think about this as a three-year project. And um, I would love to talk to you about this in detail. So I believe in you. I believe in your project, and I see the success of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. What a great question. Do we have an obligation and responsibility to preserve the history of our ancestors? And how is our obligation and responsibility to preserve our ancestors? Um, how do we uphold that? Do we preserve historical monuments? Uh, do we preserve the land? And whose responsibility is it? And so here's a person who his life was changed as the result of losing his father very early in his life. And so the process of the cemetery is a valid process, and it's a place of a deep level of respect. Thank you, Gail, for being open, honest, and sharing your question with us. And uh, we send that great thought out to you that the resources that you need to preserve this historical monument is given to you. Okay, I'm ready for my next caller. Do we have somebody waiting on the line for me? Hello? 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 This Who's is this? Susan. Hey, Susan, how are you? Oh, I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Just a moment. Okay. Okay, can you hear me, Suzanne? I can hear you just fine, Susan. How's your day going? It's going very well. Thank you. Thank you. What's your question? So I have... I have a question. I have always been on a journey of understanding self, uh, learning more about deepening myself. And lately I'm, I'm needing to know how to take what considerations I should take moving forward in life. I'm just feeling kind of like I've hit a plateau a little bit after a bunch of unearthing and finding out more about myself and need a little bit of direction. Fabulous. Okay, so you are a, um, you're an orphan. You're, you're a person who was placed up for adoption and raised in a family. You were loved, but you also knew that that was not your family. Yes, it's true. Okay, okay. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing because when you're raised with your family, that you're, you're raised with the family and you know those siblings are by the same mother and the father, um, you understand a lot about yourself without having to really think about it. You understand your eye color. You understand why you do things the way you do them because everybody in your family did them that way. Now, you can consciously choose to continue that way or you can make a change and do your life very differently. But in your case... What has happened is, is that you're now taking, and like many people, I believe, you've put your DNA into Ancestry.com. Is that right? I did do that. Yes, just recently. Okay. So, so then things that you never expected showed up. I mean, you had an expectation. You thought you were going to find certain things, but then a whole bunch of other stuff showed up that you never expected. That's very true. I had a whole family when I hadn't considered that there were others. I was just 
kind of looking at parents. Okay, so I'm going to talk really quickly, but I'm going to cover this topic really well. Okay. If you, there are six archetypes for the child, and your archetype for the child is the orphan. And so if you're an orphan, you don't really know what you got from who. And so when you meet these other people, even at this point in time in your life, it's like you get the use of an arm that you never had before. And part of you, part of your brain says, no, we don't need that. And it rejects it because if it accepts that information, your brain has to work harder to integrate that information. So there's resistance. There is true resistance. But the person who is the orphan in their child archetype is the person who is looking for a good family, people that are good for them. But if you've never seen what a good family looks like or why you look like your family, you don't know where to look for this group of people that are like you. You're looking for your people, but you don't know what they look like. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So okay. you're going you're gonna to have to make yourself willing to go on this journey, and it might take you three years to take and put the information into place and put it into order. You know, you're going to keep documents. You're going to keep journals. You're going to keep findings. You're going to keep observations, and you're going to keep it in one book, And then you're going to go out and you're going to accumulate the information. And some of the information may never really add up. Other pieces of information will be like, oh, now I get why I'm like that. So there's going to be some great ah ahas in there. But I'm I'm really awed by your ability to be this brave and to go out and seek answers for your journey. So... Please congratulate and acknowledge yourself for being brave enough to get answers for something that there never really are going to be full answers and being willing to accept partial answers and part of the truth. So that is courageous. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. There's a part of me looking very much forward to this. So thank you for your time. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Nope, that's it. You got it all. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So if we take a look at archetype work, archetype work being the process of understanding where different pieces of um, our subconscious state rests on our chakras, and we look at how that subconscious state resting on our chakras affects our interaction with other people and, of course, our life purpose and going forward, our relationships, you really get a deeper understanding of how having information of who you are is a primary ingredient to understand the sort of people that you're attracted to. So... I really like Carolyn May's archetype work. She did some amazing work. She did it when she was incredibly young. Uh, She did it with another person. And um, when I think about archetype work, I think about the subconscious pieces that are inside of your chakras that you're moving through life with. And you can live in a place of unconscious unawareness or you can live in a place of consciousness and awareness. And obviously, when you choose awareness, you get greater benefits because when you see the past with great clarity, then you can see the future. Um, If the past is clouded and unclear, it leaves you with doubt and uncertainty. Okay, how are we doing here today? Are we moving forward? Are we moving at a good speed here and going through these readings in a, in a, a direct manner? Do I have another caller waiting on the line for me here? Do we have another caller? Hey, Suzanne. Hey, who's this? Uh, hang tight. Let me, I was on speaker. All right. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Who is it? Uh, hi, my name is Nick. Um, I'm 36 years old, uh, single, uh-huh. never married. Okay. And so um, I guess uh, the topic I'd like to 
kind of cover. Um, I'm relatively successful uh, despite a, a fundamental lack of effort or ambition. Um, <laughs> I keep waiting for uh, something cathartic to give me purpose or some sort of life definition. Um, okay. You know, I have uh, experienced some, you know, perceived abilities in the in the way of intuition and a couple of occasions like telepathy. Um, so I just uh, I feel like my mind and my heart are open to a, some sort of universal sign that will, you know, make me feel like I'm going in one direction or another. Um, but, uh-huh. You know, at the moment I kind of feel like I'm just kind of meandering through life and things are working out, but I don't have a necessarily a... Um, Nick. Like purpose. Nick. Yeah. Hey, what's your birthday? Hey. Uh, three nine eighty four. Three nine eighty four. Okay. So my first impression of you when I was listening to you talk was that you have a multi layered, complex, um, emotionally intertwined relationship with your mother. True or untrue? Um, I don't know. I'd, I'd want to get more granular on intertwined, but I don't know. I don't have a whole the time for that. But um, I wouldn't say it's. I maybe you would describe it as such. Let's let's travel down that path. Okay. You say you're successful without having to make much effort. Are you talking about monetary success, emotional success? Um, oh, definitely not of- emotional. <laughs> Okay. okay. I mean, I'm in a better place. It's been a you know life's a journey, and so I'm in a better place than I was when I was uh, you know a child, or even through uh, adolescence and young adulthood. Uh, somewhere in my later twenties, I started to kind of like figure out how to navigate the emotional state. I was always more um, intellectual than Reactive. emotional, and Reactive. so now developing some sort of uh, emotional intelligence. Um, and like, I don't okay. know that it's necessarily going to lead me into a. Uh, uh, like a deep relationship with another human being. I used to be on the lookout Nick. for that, but yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Nick, <but laughs> What's up? You are you are talented. You're fabulous. You want to be empathetic. Um, the question is, is that you question how the outcome is before you enter into a situation. So you want 100%. to know the outcome. Want to know the outcome before you enter in. And life isn't like that, okay? So here's what we do. We say, okay, that looks good, that feels good, and I'm going to try it. And if it isn't good, it's okay for me to say, that's not right for me. Or I like that situation, but I don't have um, 10 hours a week for it. I've got two hours a week for it. So your thing today to get you started, because I don't think Mm -hmm. anybody's ever taken you through the process of getting you started, of saying, you know, hey, you got a problem in your life and you need to move. I'm happy with bringing by boxes and tape for you. I'll buy the boxes and I'll buy the tape, but I'm not, I'm not okay with moving your refrigerator down a staircase. Your journey is about learning to say no to people and say, I can do this much, but I can't do that much. And what you've always been asked to do is to give and just give and, and not ask any questions. And so I'm telling you, it's okay to say to somebody, hey, that sounds cool, and I'm happy to do it, but, you know, I kind of want some time to myself, so if I can drop by for a couple hours, that's good. Otherwise, no. That's where you have to start. You want the answer first. You want to know the results are going to be really good, and it's going to support you in your dream. And then you're like, okay, now I'll start. But we don't have any energy or momentum to create a good outcome or a bad outcome until we enter into it. And you do have a tendency to be indecisive. And I don't mean that as a criticism. I think sometimes people are afraid of making a decision. And I think the most important point for you to remember is is that a decision, good or bad, is really okay because it's a decision. It's the non-decision or the inability to make the decision and the waiting to make the decision and thinking you can make the decision when the circumstances are correct that cause you the conflict. Yeah, that's something uh, I've recently started to become aware of. Cool. I'm going to take an end our reading right here. That's a good point. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling me. It's great. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Nick, for being brave and courageous and talking about something deeply personal on the air with a lot of people listening in. I think one of the things that happens is that a um, child is raised in a home, and the home doesn't really understand the child. They, a parent often does for their children what they believe would have been best for them, not what is best for the child in front of them. And I think sometimes God has a great sense of humor in that he places children that challenge us at our deepest level inside of our life. And so in Nick's story, he as a child was never really given that opportunity to say, well, that isn't right for me. It was like, well, this is what's right for the family. This is what's right for the mother. And this, this causes, a lot of, uh, causes a lot of discord and it causes conflict for the child. Okay, I'm ready for my next reading. Do we have another person on the line here? No, nobody here on the line. Okay, so let's see if I can keep talking to myself here into the open air. So I love family relationships. I love romantic relationships. I love stories about people being in love. I love working with people and helping them to resolve their deeper issues in their relationships. And it doesn't really matter what tool you use, whether you take and do a guided meditation and you show them how they are holding on to an old wound or an old hurt, and you show them how to resolve that, or if you take a person through a process and show them how they could have the life they wanted if they let go of it. So there's many tools available if you're working as a psychic to guide people through processes in order to get what they want in relationships. Um... I was listening to Napoleon Hill this morning, and he was saying that unhappy, unfulfilled relationships are probably uh, just as much the root cause of people having mental illness as just about anything else. And I thought love, not feeling loved and understood, really is a source of a great deal of pain. Having somebody who's our partner, somebody who loves us and accepts us exactly the way we are, and allows us to fulfill our life is a very complex process, and many people never really fully negotiate that that whole relationship. So, okay, are we, Tiffany, do we have anybody waiting on the line to talk to me, or have I talked to every single person? Hey, who's there? This is Stan Freeze and Tara Freeze. No way! Oh, Stan! One of my most favorite people in the whole world. Hi, Stan. Hi, Tara. Oh, Hi, yeah, how what are a, you? Good. What a treat. <laughs> tell me. Well, tell here me. we are, girl. Good to talk to you. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. Tell me what you are currently working on, you and Stan and Tara. What are you guys currently doing? Currently, we uh, have our energies into uh, Stan Freeze Productions Entertainment. And we're mm-hmm. booking, we're booking ta- live talent bands and whatever uh, here in Southern California. And then, uh, then the other thing is that we're, uh, we still uh, have an investment, and and we're following and hoping for the best for this uh, therapeutics company that we invested in in China that uh, mm-hmm. is working on their second stage of a cure for for uh, lung cancer and brain mm-hmm. cancer. And so okay. we were wondering if you've got anything on that. Okay, great. Thanks for the question. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions first, and then I'm going to go to work on answering that. So have you gotten any written information back about where they are in the um, Yeah, they're phase? still in testing. They're still in okay. testing. And they haven't taken it to human testing yet. And they'll probably need another three to four million dollars to get it to uh, the place where they're in human testing. But the the signs are pretty positive. Okay. So we we invested in it a couple of years ago. So we're just uh, okay. we're kind of wondering about that. Okay. So okay. So I've got one more question before I answer the question. Yeah. Uh-huh. And that is is that. Um, if somebody has um, lung cancer and they're dying, would the American FDA um, experimental process allow people to get that treatment? Because it is a successful treatment. It is a good treatment. It does produce good results. It is 
just has so many steps to go through. So if somebody right. does somebody have the option of getting that treatment even though it is experimental at this point? Uh, no, it would have to have the FDA approval. Okay. And so have you, have you gone on to um, the um, alternative radio program and talked about the fact that this is a successful treatment, but it is being, it is being taken and held in this category? And have you petitioned for the right for people that could potentially die with no treatment? Have you petitioned for them to have the right to try this process? Have we? No, that that probably wouldn't be up to us. It'd probably be up to the the uh, you know the higher ups in the company, the doctor that's doing this, and and his board of directors. Okay, I'm just going to ask you to put this out. We're in we're just invest we're just investors hoping for the best. Okay, you you're doing more than hoping for the best. You're manifestors. You Stan, you and Tara are manifestors of the first order. You take and make a prayer, and it comes into manifestation. So you're going to make this prayer that it becomes available for people that have no other alternative but to seek an experimental procedure, and you're going to ask for it to be made available. This shifts the process. Did anything happen in December? Anything at all happen in December? With this, uh, they had a board of of directors meeting in in January, right? It was the first part of January. Yeah, they had a board of uh, directors meeting the first part of January. Okay, and That's all, was that yeah. good? That, that was good, I assume. Yeah, well, you know what it was? Uh, they, they released, um, you know, the results of that meeting, the transcripts of that meeting to us. Cool. So that's why we're, we're that's why, we're, and, and at that meeting, they, they brought everybody up to speed as to actually where they were on this. Cool. Okay, so Stan, here's what you're going to do. In your they, can go, they can go in the toilet in 30 seconds the whole thing, or it can, it can continue and really do well. It's one of those can, things, you know. Okay. It continues. It does really well. It is a process of where I'm going to ask you to hold a prayer. You and Tara hold the prayer that this is information that becomes discovered as an experimental process, and people sign away all their rights and all their responsibilities, and then they petition for the right to try it. And this changes the knowledge about this product, and it gets it to a different stage quickly. The people that are handling this need some people to encourage them through prayer and meditation and give them guidance. Okay? Mm-hmm. So Great. So no, no, no worries. This project continues on, and... You know, Stan, you need to remember what a great manifester you are. You and Tara together are, I mean, powerful manifestors. Well, I've got copies of our stock certificate that I have under my crystals, and then I do a pendulum (laughs) over them every day. Okay. Let's let's take and um, put um, put people around them, put little people around them, and see these people healed and cured from incurable cancer. And then let's add gotcha. that to your prayer process, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, That's great. Tim. Thank you, Tara. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks. You too. Love you dearly. You. Bye-bye. Oh, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Stan and Tara Freeze, two of uh, some of the most dynamic, energetic um, people I've ever had the great pleasure of working with, uh, musician. Stan, I think, is a third generation, second or third generation musician, and he has, of course, created several great musicians uh, himself. His children and his grandchildren are great musicians today in the world. A great blessing for them to give us a quick call and talk about what's going on as far as their focus as working as humanitarians to make the world a better place. So... um, Let's see, where are we? We're coming up on the end here. We're in our final 10 minutes here of this conversation. So let me, uh, let me do a conversation about who I am and what I'm doing here today. Show call in number is 206-806-9965. And if you'd like to call in, I've got time for one more reading, I think. It is the, di- the deep psychic reading at gmail.com. That's how you can write to me and contact me personally. You can also call me at 714-400-7384. I'm specializing in the deep reading. 
I want to talk to people about their deepest issues, their deepest problems, and what is going on for them today in the world. So I'm just going to do a quick check here with um, my producer and see if there's anybody waiting to take and be dropped into the phone call. Nobody waiting. Okay. So I'm looking for somebody to give me one last call in, and that would be 206-806-9965. And I am talking about the deepest issues in human psyche. I'm talking about the problems that are deep. They're below the surface. They are not conflicts. They are issues. If you have a problem, there's a solution automatically, and that is the promise that we're given. So call in and talk to me. Try and keep your – I love doing dreams. So I'd like somebody who could call in and ask me a question about a dream. That would be really nice. And if not that, then we have – Oh, so there's nobody else who's calling in today. That was that was all of my call-ins for today. Great news. <clears throat> I started out the conversation today talking about um, learning to do tea leaf readings, and I do a tea party, and when I do a tea party, I take and I do tea leaves, and I use Persian tea because Persian tea is the one that's loose and uncut, and it just goes into a teapot. You drink a cup of tea, and then you do an interpretation from it. So... People do this in China, people do this in India, and people do this in Scotland. Don't ask me, because I have have no idea. So the English say they are the ones who brought the tradition and the custom to England through colonialism, and the Scottish say that they always did it. And if you want to look at the genetic pools, as far as people that are really good at doing tea leaf reading... It is people that um, have a stronger Scottish background. So I always um, am kind of intrigued by people that can take and um, they look into a teacup and they see a series of um, images and when they look in there and they see those images, they can tell the person a little story about what's going on in their life. And I do it with my coffee every morning. And um, Turkish coffee, dream interpretation, uh, they're... You know they're in the same they're in the same category. Oh, we've got Rebecca here waiting for me to talk to. Yeah, Tiffany, let's talk to Rebecca. That would be lovely. Hello. Hi, Rebecca. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you doing? Really good. Thank you for calling today. Of course. Thank you. Okay. So let's let's talk about you. What's your question? Rebecca? Um, yes. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> do you have a question? <laughs> um, I, I, I do. I just, um, I kind of just want to know, like, in terms of, like, uh, any type of things going on for, like, the future or, like, in terms of, what um like what's my next step or anything like that okay are you working um i do i work i work two jobs actually okay so i work one full-time job and one part-time job okay which job do you like the best (laughs) um they both give me good balance but um i do i do like my full-time job i've been there for over almost 12 years so um, that's one I'm a little bit more dedicated to. Okay. That's good. That's really good. So for you in your work situation, in order for you to improve your money situation, there's certain things that you need to sort of carefully outline in your work environment. It has to be stable. It has to be secure. It has to be able to be repeatable work. So if you don't work your best if there's too much uncertainty, unpredictability, and too many changing factors. You like to be well-trained and well-educated. I'm often disappointed in companies that they don't take the time and the money to educate and train a good employee. They take and put somebody into a situation and see that they have part of the attributes that are necessary, 
but then they're not willing to train and educate them for the other part that they may not have. And you really are an ideal employee because you're not selfish, you're not greedy, and you're extremely honest, and you're willing to work very, very hard. And so um, in this situation that you're working in, I think the thing that you like the most is the security and the predictability and being really good at it. Okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So now, so now I want you to ask or look online, and you can ask somebody to help you look this up, see if there's further training and education available for the current company that you're working with. And I'm not going to say it's going to be easy or it's going to be convenient or anything else like that. But when you get further training, you as a person, you actually feel better. You feel more confident. You feel happier. You do better. And you can expand. You have this interesting... So, so tell, me, tell me what it is you do because it looks like a kitchen to me. So tell me what it is you do. <laughs> um, I work as a barista. Uh-huh. And I work as a sales associate. Um, when you work as when you work as a sales associate, what are you doing? Uh, just cashiering, just kind of greeting, helping, um, you know, bringing people up, supplying okay. products. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. So I think it's I think it's the kitchen is the barista, the taking and the steaming and all of those things. You have a real natural gift. And I see that if you take and are patient and you work with the company that you're working with and you ask them for further training and education, they give you a better opportunity. So it's a great growth cycle for you, and I don't think that there's any problem with that. And it does give you, it gives you more money, but it isn't really about the money that I'm really focused on. I'm concerned about the fact that you get a feeling of, feeling good about doing something that you're really good at and you know you're really talented at and it makes people feel really good to see somebody really good at their work. And that's the big benefit I see for you. Um, And then as the result of that, you actually are able to attract, because you're in a better place, you're able to attract the other things that you want in your life and your life becomes more fulfilled. So those are my suggestions for you to okay. um, improve your money. And um, thank you for being so kind and being so honest and open and authentic in your conversation with me. I really appreciate you today. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for letting me talk. I really appreciate that as well and your advice and everything. So that's great. All right. All right. Have a good day. Thank you so much. You too. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Something about when you see somebody doing their work and when they do their work, they're really good at it and they they bring their spirit into it. And um, I am the sort of person that needs a good cup of coffee every single day. And so coffee is not a small thing for me. It is a big thing for me. And um, having somebody who, who does a good cup of coffee, there's nothing like it. And after I get done with having my great cup of coffee, I take and I um, I do this over the kitchen sink. I take and I twist my coffee cup into the sink, and then I look at the casting at the bottom, and it tells me basically what is going on for the day in front of me. I suggest this process. I only drink out of a white coffee cup, white inside, white outside, and I take and I do it every day. Sometimes I look in there and there's nothing more than sunrise or sunset, and I look at that, and it's like, okay, this is, this is a day that, you know, is a day. And, and that's important all of itself. But there are other times when I look in there, and it leads me on a journey, and it tells me a story of what is going to happen in the upcoming day. So um, somebody who makes coffee is very important to my way of thinking. And a good cup of coffee, that's worth an awful lot. So, Rebecca, thank you very much for calling and talking honestly and openly about wanting to make more money and to be able to provide for yourself better. It's a great goal. Okay? Let's see. What else have we got going on today? We're at the point where we wrap up the conversation. I'm in my final minute. 
So um, Thursdays, and uh, that's my day for this uh, podcast. I call myself the, the deep psychic. I do the deep psychic reading. Um, no bliss bunny act here. Definitely deep information. And if you want to write to me, you can write to me at the deep psychic reading at gmail.com. I know, not very imaginative. And if you want to read about some of the things I've done in the past as a party psychic, you can go to www.bestpartypsychicever.com. And I do do parties. I do love the tea party of all of the parties in the world to do. The tea party is the one that is the most fun. It is not about anything more than enjoying a great cup of tea and sitting with your friends and being able to relax and um, eat little bits of food. You're not supposed to be there to eat a big meal. You're just supposed to be there to enjoy the food with the tea. So tea party is one of my favorite parties to do in the whole world. And um, every time I've done a tea party, it always turns out that there is at least one person, very often two people, that have a natural ability to look into the cup and see what is, what is the image in the cup. So my favorite book for this is Reading Tea Leaves, and it's written by an anonymous source. He says that he's a highland seer. I, um, I think that part of it is kind of fictionalized. But it is an excellent book. It's a great teaching book. It's a great guiding piece of material, and it is of great assistance. So there we are, and it's been a great show. I hope you heard something about yourself that you can use. I hope that this was a broad enough message that it assisted many people and made it better for everyone else. And thank you very much, and I hope that you will listen in next week. Suzanne Wyman, The Deep Psychic, doing The Deep Psychic Reading. Have a great day. Bye. Don't want the fun to end? Grab more refreshments, then head over to Goldilocks Productions' YouTube channel. With over 950 archive shows, the fun doesn't have to end.